very much Joe. Actually all of my books are very personal. It, it, it saves a lot of money on therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm convinced that all the famous authors of the world were just looking for a break from their psychiatrists. <laughs> 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 uh, but um, I just came out with uh, another book called uh, Bridges Across an Impossible Divide. The Inner Lives of Arab and Jewish Peacemakers, most of whom were spiritual peacemakers. And um, it's a healthier book for me for the first time than the, the one Joe mentioned and uh, the first one, because those were much more tortured books that came from the 90s and <coughs> the efforts before the Intifada. And, and that was a time in my life that I thought individuals could actually prevent wars <coughs> that they focused their attention on. And little did I understand, I understand a lot more now how much um, we all do have an amazing impact on the world around us, especially when we will to, but it's almost never where you expect it to be. And that the arrogance of uh, humanity is thinking that my effects are going to be where I intend them to be. But the reality of my effects is un unmistakable. We're all part of a web of life where, where both every word that comes out of our mouth for bad and every word that comes out for good have very surprising consequences. But at the same time, it's our hope and our desire that it's going to be exactly what we intend. And, and throughout history, the great peacemakers, the great social change makers from Gandhi to King, um, so many others, they all died disappointed about what they had hoped their effect would be. Totally unaware of where, in fact, their effect would be in the end. So that Gandhi dies feeling a failure because he could not stop Hindus and Muslims from killing each other. Little did he know that he would be the key to a solidarity movement in Poland and many other places in Europe that would have such a deep level of nonviolence in it, an actual love, conversionary love, that it would, it would save Poland and much of Europe um, the, the misery that so many other civil wars had caused in other parts of the world. God, he couldn't have known that. So one of the things in an evolution of my consciousness is the the spiritual power that we all have to evolve ourselves, to become better at what we do, but to sort of release that yearning and desire, in my part, in my, in my case, about the Arab-Israeli tragedy, uh, a Jewish-Palestinian tragedy, um, but to release that and to focus more on the, on the spiritual journey and on the effectiveness of what we do and the refocusing of the, the negative energy towards the positive we do, the better we become and the more whole we become as people. So a lot of this book is actually a celebration of individuals uh, and their inner lives who I worked with for many years in Israel and Palestine and in Syria. And if you'd caught me ten years ago, I would have been broken by this. Uh, in fact, I, 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 I decided to tell their stories in their own words with videos, and this book is based on transcripts and analysis. I decided to do it because I had so failed to give them the one thing they wanted from me, which was the power to do what they do best in the world. The one thing about the great spiritual peacemakers across enemy divides in the world is that they are absolutely powerless and poor. And I would come to Israel filled up with all of these nonsensical conflict resolution theories and always willing to help and why they just wanted money. <laughs> because the military industrial complex was flooding the region of the Middle East and the Arab Israeli conflict with billions of dollars towards killing. Billions of dollars towards advanced weaponry for Israel, for Egypt, for Jordan, eh, making fortunes for people in the region, for people mostly in the United States, but in also in Germany and other places, and at the same time, the Gulf fortunes of money for suicide bombing and everything else. So I came to a certain point where I realized that 
the humanity just does change dramatically. And there's great evidence for the, the power of the interfaith revolutions of the last hundred years that they're having an impact. But they're never where exactly you want them to be. You know, I mean, a million people die in Rwanda over a, a matter of months. And it's the second or third genocide. And that country now is far ahead of Israel-Palestine in terms of reconciliation. Serbia, unbelievable genocide, horrific. And now the war criminals are in jail and they're experiencing a democracy where people are equal. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's ahead of Israel-Palestine. So, you know, there's many surprises in history because, again, the Serbians were inspired by good interfaith work, good nonviolent resistance work, good conflict resolution skills, negotiation skills. Many of our, our evolutions as human beings in the last 400 years are paying off. They're paying off from secular constructs of peace, and they're paying off from religious constructs of peace. But as a personal survivor of this work, the, the, the reason why so few people do interfaith work in war zones is that it's heartbreaking. It is being a cancer doctor where most of your patients die. Not even the high surviving cancers. It's, 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 it's being with the, you know, being in the early stage of cancer research where most of the patients die. And it just goes on. I left Israel in despair in 2000 because I had finished. I had, I had uh, um, the interfaith work we did there was, was delicate, it was special, it had no money to it, but it was brilliant. We, we actually, without any resources whatsoever, because all resources in religions are basically reserved for the institutional constructs of organized religion that are basically a very secular affair. One of the things that I've learned in the last 10 years is to realize that when people talk about religion and peace or religion and conflict, they're actually talking about organized secular religion. They're talking about the institutions of personal survival of religions. And that's not to be confused at all with the spiritual and religious lives of hundreds of millions of people throughout history. There are two different things. It's institutional religion, which it's much better to go to Henry Kissinger to understand. Our theories of interfaith do not explain the behavior of religious hierarchies at all, in, especially in conflict zones. Not in Israel, not in, in Syria. You have to have a sober, realist understanding of what this mufti is doing and what this hierarchy is doing in this uh, country in Central Europe. The people I work with in interfaith, they know this very well. And they go to Henry Kissinger to understand that. But the people who are actually saving lives and making history and changing history, they're penniless. They're not supported by their institutions. They're doing things on the sly. All of my work was always somebody else paid me to go to Jerusalem to do something else entirely, and then on the sly I went. I'll never forget, it was like uh, I would go to Jerusalem to teach a course at Hebrew University through some organization, and Eventually, they started to realize that I was slipping out of the country and going to Syria. And they were okay, but, you know, again, it was this affair where I'm sleeping on, on floors at the Allenby Bridge, and I have two passports, and it's all secret, and I'm moving in between Jordan and Syria, not being able to tell the Jordanians where I'm going either direction, the Syrians not being able to find out where I'm going, all in order to embrace a Shiite sheikh and a Christian pastor, an evangelical pastor, and a... And a, and a mufti, and a, and a, and a born-again Christian, all working for peace in, inside Syria, inside a police state. And there's nothing on the planet that would support that. But we knew we had to do it. And ironically, I, I left Israel in despair after 2000 because of the outbreak of the Intifada, the second Intifada. And we had done some great work, again, without any, without an, any support from the United States. The European countries were actually better, and some unofficial Americans in the embassies gave us secret support, like a car ride here and there, and, and, and had some help getting across the border when I screwed up my passport once. 
on the Allenby Bridge. <laughs> I'll never forget that. There was an, an embassy official on the other side who was one of our secret friends. And he helped to explain to the Jordanians that I was inexperienced and I didn't know how to use my passports. And, you know, so there was that kind of support. But really, it's only in the last few years that some of us are working with State Department a lot more on the importance and value of interfaith work for peace building and for diplomacy. And that's, and that's moving in a better direction, but still not easily understood by, by the world of governments. What we had done inside Israel and Palestine before was that we saw, and, and this is where faith, people of faith are very good, is that the, the ones that have truly sensitive souls are very good at reading leaders, reading their strengths and reading their, reading their weaknesses, and figuring out how to take a leader to a different space of thought, of where, what, what's the vision of how life could be different. And, and, and knowing that these leaders usually have a lot of blood on their hands, and you're going to try to you know, sit with their souls anyways. People have immense power. People don't realize, for example, that Nelson Mandela, uh, after National Congress, had a violent history. There were people involved when he had to make a decision about whether to nationalize white property once he was about to gain power. Do you realize how many people would have died if it was a civil war in South Africa instead of that transition? I mean, as it is, South Africa is still on a domestic level, a basket case. But if it had been a bloody war between whites and, 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 and the majority blacks, Nelson Mandela was deciding in a plane whether to do that. And it was because of his spiritual relationships and personal relationships that he saw a vision of a different future of South Africa, where that nationalization would have been revenge rather than justice. Because the injustice of slaughter is something that he said, we can't do. So these fateful decisions at key moments of leaders is critical to how the world ends up in war or peace. We sat with Yasser Arafat. I tell this story, I've told this story before. How did I get into Yasser Arafat? I was a professor, he's right, I don't deserve a chair, I don't deserve anything, I happen to have written some books. By accident I ended up, I, I shouldn't have a normal job. I just write well. And, and they think I'm a scholar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I ended up, I, I, I didn't have that at that time. I didn't have anything. I was an adjunct professor somewhere. Um, <laughs> and I, I was friendly with this rabbi, a, a crazy West Bank rabbi, who had it in his head to pioneer the Messiah coming, not only by settlements, but also by settlements with Palestinians and Jews in love, in love with each other. And he had a vision that Hamas and Islam were going to come along with it. He's a crazy man. <laughs> and it's his visions that now have turned out to be more realistic about the future than all of the other political, advanced political theories that think tanks in town concocted, which have all turned out to be a disaster, and his vision has turned out to be much more realistic about sharing Jerusalem and many other things. So this man, you know, he's insistent. I have to get into see Yasser Arafat. Uh, so how was it? I, I think I happened to have sent him a letter from a, um, a supporter of mine who was friendly with the chief of staff of Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton had sent a letter complimentary of my work, and so did the chief of staff. So I faxed this to him, and I just said, you know, we're trying to work here because his insistence was that the American president was the key to bringing the Palestinian leadership and the Israeli leadership into a room and really working that room. And he, and he saw that almost in salvific terms, in messianic terms. So he gives this letter, this fax letter, he gives it to the Palestinian, the PLO, and, and they come back, they he tells them that I'm a personal friend of Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I end up sitting next to Yasser Arafat as a guest of honor. <laughs> and I just didn't say anything. But so, you know, 
<laughs> we just, you know, you go along with the flow sometimes in our work because there's no support. And you're working with people who are desperate. He didn't even have cab fare between Jerusalem and Ramallah, you know? Um, and we, yeah, we went with this contingent of this Sufi sheikh, Muslim Palestinian Sufi sheikh, this, this, this Jewish prophetess who was, was in visions. And, and this West Bank rabbi and me, this crazy professor who's been doing peace work as he described back in the 90s when I was still working out my relationship with Christians in Europe in, uh, in, in, in a co. And um, they were very patient with me. I was very uh, angry Jew at the time. And um, I taught them a lot. They taught me a lot. It was a really spectacular evolution of spirit. So. We get to Yasser Arafat, and that was an amazing thing, because we're in the border, and you know, the, the, the border was, there was no, uh, it was more even then. It was shooting, and you know, you, and this guy with a big gun, massive big gun, and, and he was, he was, he was a, a red hair, redhead, not typical Jewish. And he's, he's big, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm used to small Jews in the United States. <laughs> in Israel, we grow them big. And, you know, and he's got this big guy, and he's not looking at me, and he says, you guys have to get out of here. You have to get out of here, because the crowds were angry, and it, it was, it, and, I, and I, I just, I had a presence of mind at that moment, and I just, I was one of my better moments. In Co, I had very bad moments, very misbehaved, but when I was... Uh, somehow with the gun pointing at me, I was better. I don't know why. <laughs> so, you know, I, I looked at him and I said, I said to him, this must be very hard for you. You know, I don't know what possessed me to say that. And he said, I'd rather be in Tel Aviv on the beach with my children. You know, and he said, okay, go. You know, and we didn't know, we didn't have any, we didn't have a ride to Ramallah. And suddenly this, this, this van pulls up with blackened windows. We're talking about the Middle East. And it opens up a door and they say, get in. And the rabbi and the shiva just say, okay, let's get in. It's from God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I'm saying that it's probably the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. And the rabbi is reciting psalms and he said, it's going to be okay. We're protected. The angels. <laughs> So I get in, and, and I don't know who that, where that person came from, but they go like this. They went around the corner, and then uh, uh, behind the bank, away from the border, and you see this, this stream of Palestinians going back and forth along this dirt road, it, climbing over things, and that's the unofficial border where everybody was just going illegally between Israel and Palestine at that time. Now you can't do that as much. There's a big wall. So everybody walking, and they said, here, you can go here. So we walk across the border. This rabbi with the beard down to the floor, this, this Sufi sheikh flowing white clothing, you know, and me, and we're walking. Everybody, angry Palestinians everywhere, and it's the middle of the war. And then on the other side, we get picked up, thank God, by, a, by a, one of these rovers, these big, expensive, black uh, Humvees. And I get in. What's our salvation on the other side? A uh, Hamas guy. He's going to take us to Arafat. I say, oh my God, what's happened to my life that I feel safe now that I'm with a Hamas guy? <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, I grew up on the Holocaust. I grew up on, you know, all Arabs are going to kill you. I mean, and then here I am. Thank God is a Hamas guy. I'm in a safe Humvee now. <laughs> So this is interesting interfaith work. This is, <laughs> and this is not as untypical as you think of what is what goes on with the people who are actually going over borders. Once we got into the room with Arafat and with the others, it was a very interesting affair where where the rabbi was focusing and the sheikh were focusing on visionary things. Everybody else talks negotiations, but one thing we know about about the interfaith moment about peace is that what's missing by, from so many negotiations is that the negotiations focus on problems, on me versus you, and your identity versus my identity, and on the, all these things, and not on a vision. And one of the strengths of religion at its best, I'm not talking about institutional religion, I'm talking about spirituality, is that it's very good at visioning different worlds. 
better worlds. That's what prayer is all about. It's what, it's what many things are all about. Prophecies. And so they were doing this with Arafat. And Arafat was a spiritual man. He may, have, he may have had a lot of blood in his hands, but he was a spiritual man and he loved him. Nobody in these negotiations at Camp David ever sat with him and did that. So it was opening up things. It was warming things up. Me, I'm a troublemaker. Like I said, from Co, I was a troublemaker. Did I have to tell you, Joe, that the reason they planted that tree? No, no. The reason, you remember they had a room that was named after somebody I, I didn't like from World War II, right? You remember? We're not going to name the name. And I said to them, if you don't take the name down of that, that room, I'm never coming back here. You know, and it was like this real struggle. And, and the poor people who were working with me, they were the ones who wanted Jews there. And I was always yelling at them. You know, I was very immature at the time. <laughs> but they ended up planting this beautiful tree because I had discovered how many Jews were saved by coming across the border into Switzerland and how many at the border were refused entry. So it was like 40,000 that had made it across and, and many others that had, had died because Switzerland couldn't let them in. And it was a very powerful memory there and people didn't want to talk about it. And one thing that Jews want to do is they want to talk about things. And one thing that a lot of these cultures don't want to do is talk about things, is talk about the past. And so I forced the conversation. And in the end, they, they planted that tree and the language was quite beautiful for all the people who, in honor of all the people who came across and of those who didn't. You know, and it was a beautiful kind of thing. And I'll never forget the day that uh, somebody comes up to me and sits on this beautiful veranda and we're looking over the spot where people couldn't come from France. And he says to me, it with the steely blue eyes, he says to me, I was a border guard. That's all he could say. But he was apologizing. It was a beautiful moment. So that's where I was schooled. But now we're in the crazy Middle East, and we're with Arafat. And we have these crazy shayats and everything talking about the future Jerusalem of heaven. You know? <laughs> okay. So I decided to bring it down to earth a little, and I, and I remember saying, I remember saying, um, I said, in my tradition, it's a mitzvah, it's an obligation to mourn with people when someone has died. And I want to express my mourning and my sorrow over the you know, 300 children that have died so far in the Intifada. And the room just... Because it just, it just shifted everything. I wanted to bring the dead into the room. And I wanted to, I wanted to do it from my side, from my identity and my, and my place. And you know, things shifted. And, um, you know, Arafat's over here, and like I said, he's, he's okay with these kind of conversations, and he's very quiet, he barely says anything. And he's got all of his politicians lined up on the other side, his statesmen and generals. Why are they there? Because they think, they think I'm Bill Clinton's friend. <laughs> and, they're, and they're just listening to this conversation. You see the mouths dropping more and more. First we're in Jerusalem of heaven, and now we're mourning over children. What's going on here? This is a state meeting. And then I said to him, I, I, I want to I share with you something from my tradition. Because I knew, because Arafat started looking at me very carefully after I, after I expressed sorrow for the children. So I, I said to him, and again, it's, I'm, you know, my tradition, Talmudic tradition, is a troublemaking tradition. It doesn't like neatness. It actually likes to mix things up. And, and, and I, I, I love Jesus. And Jesus comes out of, a lot of the parables come out of that tradition of making trouble. You know, of mixing up the mind a little bit. And I said to him that the, you know, the world, Talmud says the world stands on three things. <coughs> on truth, and on justice, and on peace. And then Rabbi Muna, whoever that was, said, and I looked at, I looked at Arafat right I said, where there is no justice, there will never be peace. And he looked at me very deeply. And I'll explain to you what happened, actually. And then I said to him, but the second half says, where there is no peace, there can never be justice. So he knew that in the first half of the sentence, because he was very smart, he knew that in the first half, 
I was acknowledging his justice issues. Because one thing they never talked about in these meetings was, was justice. All the negotiations were always about peace, peace, peace. Problem is, you know, I take your, I take your house, and then I immediately say to you, let's be peaceful. Let, let, let's live in peace, you know? Really, really be peaceful. Let's be civilized, you know? So you don't talk justice. So the moment you come into the room and you, you, you raise the justice issue, he knew I was acknowledging who he was. But then I, I pointed out that if you can't do it peacefully, you, you can't get to the justice. And he knew I was criticizing his intifada. Which he didn't start, but he was happy to make worse. You know, he was, he was like that. And he really, really looked at me hard. You know, he narrowed his eyes. He knew I was criticizing him a little bit. And then he thought, and he thought. And then we went on with this, the heavenly conversation. And 10 minutes later, he says to me, he says, you know, I used to pray when I was a boy. I used to pray at the wall. So I said, what? I said, what wall? He couldn't be talking about the Western Wall. That's a Jewish site. I, why, why is Arafat playing, praying at the wall? So he said, you know, the wall, the old men. <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant, because the wall has always been inhabited by old Jewish men, perhaps for 2,000 years, you know? <laughs> and I knew what he was saying. He said, they did their prayers, I did my prayers. And he did, he grew up with an uncle in Jerusalem in the 1930s. And so I realized he was talking about the wall, he was saying that he prayed next to the Jews, and they were saying their prayers, and he was saying his prayers. And he said, you know, Alburak, Alburak is the name of that area for, from a Muslim perspective, of what that wall was from their perspective, to where Muhammad went in. So I realized the significance of that moment, because he was acknowledging that that was a Jewish holy site. It is that, that was never talked about. In the 1920s and 30s, there was, before all of this disaster, there were actually signs that this was the site of the ancient Jewish temple. It's okay. But once the land becomes the war, the religion becomes the war. And the holy sites, all holy sites, become an object of warfare. Every grave, every cemetery in Serbia, in all of these places, in uh, Kosovo, every grave becomes an opportunity as a weapon. But when we were talking like this, we mourned over the children, we, we traded a Talmud story, and he decides to say, I prayed there with them. Just a, a couple of months later, he's in Camp David, and it was a bad deal, no matter how brilliant Bill Clinton is and his team, it was premature, they didn't pave the way, there were many, many things that were not right about that Camp David moment. And Arafat says in the middle of this meeting, he hated Barack. Uh, uh, it was mistreated, it was, it was bad, bad diplomacy. And <clears throat> Arafat apparently says in Camp David, there was never a temple in that site. That's somewhere else. And I got a call from somebody who was in those meetings and says, can somebody please explain to that man that this is a Jewish holy place too? And that was a turning point in my life. Because I realized that with all the millions of dollars in expensive diplomacy that had gone into those meetings, I get a call in desperation at the last minute because Arafat deliberately blew up the meeting with exactly the denial of the holiness of that space because they had been so bad at preparing true reconciliation. And I said to myself, if Rabbi Froman had those billions instead of the diplomacy world, how far we could have gone. The peace was at hand. Arafat agreed to a peace treaty. He agreed to a religious peace treaty. And the Israeli administration and the United States administration said, what the hell are you talking about? A religious peace treaty. Instead of saying, why not? Which is what Arafat said, why not? Of 
course, he was dishonest to the core. He did all sorts of shenanigans. But he was serious about religion being important. And you talk anywhere in the Middle East, religion is important. And so a flexible approach to global peace is something that the interfaith community has to offer, which is that you need the heart as well as the mind. You need people's passions, their memories, their hopes, their investment in sacredness, as well as their rational plans for how to share, how to do justice, how to repair the past, how to build something that's safe and secure for everyone in the future. Of course all of those things are essential. Stepping back for a minute, there's some good news. And since that time, I've had much more despair in my life. I worked for seven years in Syria with my, my Syrian colleagues in the worst police state in the world. We figured out how to outsmart the regime and have interfaith work very publicly anyways. We gave people a taste of a spirit of debate on issues that were not allowed in public until we did our work. I'm very proud of the work we did in Syria. But in the end of the day, all the people that I worked with are on the run. Their homes are being destroyed. Every place that I walked with my classes are being bombed right now. Just, just yesterday, Bautuma. Bautuma was our home. It's an ancient walkway in old Damascus. If you bomb Bautuma, there's nothing left. one of the, the most ancient Christian sites in the world. So you, you, know, you get used to this sorrow. And I, and I despaired until I started reading some research recently. And this is where I think I'm going to go. Is that if you study the history of violence and nonviolence in the last 400 years, we're all conditioned by the horrors of the middle of the 20th century the 40 million dead, the 20 million dead in World War I. We're all used to thinking things are worse than ever. We almost had a nuclear holocaust. We were this close to humanity killing itself. And so we think that we're at the worst stage of our history. But actually, the evidence is the opposite. Yes, there's 7 billion of us, so more of us die percentage-wise. More of us die, it looks terrible. But percentage-wise, we're actually getting better and better. And religion, the best of religion, not institutional religion, but the best of religious ideas, from the great prophets to Jesus, to, to the great ideas of Hinduism, to the absolute valuation of every human being that was in a corollary of the best of the Sermon on the Mount, of the best of, of the labor rights law, laws in the Bible. All of that is merging together with secular fighting for human rights in the last 400 years that is securing more rights for women and more rights for poor people than at any time in history. There is less torture per person at this time in history than any ever before in history. And the evidence is how long people are living. The evidence is that when you do torture people, the governments do, it's, it has to be hidden. Well, just a few years ago, just a few miles from here, torture wasn't just not hidden, it was a cause for public celebration with children when they barbecued African Americans. Not far from here. We have even early picture, we have a picture from the early 20th century of children at a barbecue of, of African Americans. And now look at we go crazy when somebody uses the wrong word. That's good. That's good. That's a, that's a, a move towards more and more nonviolence, not just of our deeds, but our words. And when these things do happen, and when there is one lynching in I don't know how many years, we go crazy. And that's good. And there are many, many other places in the world where human rights is something fundamental to every human being gets in their gut. Uh, you should see the veiled, you know, the women that I work with in Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and, and in Syria. All these veiled women who are, who are passionate about human rights. 
and are changing things and getting imams to change. One of the stories is here. It's from Ibtisal Mahmir. And you should see how clever she is with the imams of her village, giving them honor and at the same time helping them step aside as women take jobs and, and do things and become leaders in the community. Figuring out clever ways to, to shift culture. And, and distinguishing it from the religion and saying the religion is for women's honor. It's just the culture that needs to shift and helping people see that. There's many, many more millions of people experiencing that than are experiencing the death and destruction right now in Syria. And it's also a mark of our progress that we're, we know exactly where the wars are, where the outrages are, from Sudan to Congo to Syria to Palestine, and we know that this is wrong this is not ideal. That research has helped me cope with, m with my sense of loss as a, as, a, as a cancer doctor. Interfaith work, at its best, is, a f is, an, is a, I think, one of the most exciting phenomena of human history. Because from the Parliament of World Religions on, 100 years now, 1896, was the first parliament of world religions in Chicago? Am I wrong? 1993. 1893? Oh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> but the parliament of world religions, this unprecedented idea of putting together all the world religions and then coming up to some common ideas, this is unprecedented in history. Because it wasn't just a lot of people gathering. It was them gathering as equals. So that religion in their minds was, there was something higher than all of their individual denominations. And as we've searched for that and discovered it, we, we've, we've come very close to, if we can just get off of our intolerances of, especially secular intolerance of religious people, we can actually see a harmonization emerging of the human rights agenda and the high spiritual agenda of the valuation of every human being's spirit that, that, that has been emerging for about a hundred years. And it's a very exciting development. It's, it's grossly underfunded in the sense that you have so much of organized religious money going towards the opposite in many places, or at least apathetic to it, and they go back to their institutional interests. And then there's the state interests, which are very, very challenging. One of the things that we've discovered is how much we think something going on is actually religious, or religious extremism, and then it turns out to be the way in which s religious constructs are at the service of very mundane interests. And, and it doesn't look like it on the surface. So I ask you a question. The madrasa tradition, the tradition of having higher academies in Islam, it's older than the, than the university traditions in Europe. In fact, it became the model when Europeans and again, you know, moved ahead, rushed ahead on many ways, but, but really the university system had been modeled by those Arab madrasas, those m Muslim madrasas, Arab, Arab Muslim madrasas. Okay, now what do we hear about madrasas? We hear about these madrasas where people are teaching radicalism in Pakistan and that the madrasas are the problem to such a degree that in Pakistan, the secular government will not have anything to do with the madrasas. But my friends in town, right here, we're the ones championing madrasas that are actually teaching conflict resolution, they're combining it with, with religious values, they're combining it with human rights, with math and science, and we're saying, what the heck? Why wouldn't you want it? You know, that's pretty practical. Why wouldn't you want it? But, you know, our state systems have their own agendas. And they look down their noses at these madrasas, but the, the secrets are different. Because the secrets are that the worst of those madrasas were funded in the 1980s by the CIA and by the Saudis to create fighters against Shiites and against Iran being able to take over Pakistan. Because from 1979 on, it was a war of Sunni Shia that the United States had great investments in. And I've spoken to the prince, the, you know, the prince who confessed that he was the one that funded the madrasas in the 80s and feels terrible. And they, they just trained them to kill. Now you tell me that that's a religious madrasa. 
that the problem is Islam and not Madras. And then I hear, you know, in recent years, I said, I said, how are those radical madrasas still functioning if the Saudis pulled out? What? You said, you know, people will say, you don't want to know. And then you, you press and you find out, well, you don't want to know. So I said, how are they making their money? To say, it's the boys. They're selling the boys. So, they're selling the boys. And we know, we just, the Boy Scouts, we, we know the disaster of, of what's done to boys and to children in the name of, of religious institutions. It's not, this is not something unique to the dark spaces of Pakistan. This is a universal problem of not facing the challenge of what it is to care for children and for men to recognize their problems and so on and so forth, right? But. This is a self-perpetuating system now that we're starting to see. Is any of this religious? Or is the religion a cover for the worst mistakes of the Cold War, the worst mistakes of state interests, and now simple criminal behavior, organized crime? So what looks like a problem with religion turns out not to be a problem with religion. It turns out to be a problem with human nature, with violence, with crime. And then, and then you have these crazy coalitions. Peter's here. We know Joe is here. We all have friends in these crazy coalitions of Muslims and Christians and Jews working in places like Pakistan and Iran quietly and, and working with the most religious people who are at the forefront of subverting this terrible, these terrible realities. So nothing is as it seems on the surface. There's also a lot of good news. And effectively, I mean, we have a, I have a program now on, in Iran that's on human rights, minorities, and conflict resolution. It's all virtual because we cannot get into the country. It's all very exciting. The work in Afghanistan was, was monumental because we brought together 100 Muslim imams, who, many of whom had, had, had almost lost their lives. Some of them were being killed by the Taliban for talking about human rights, for talking about women's rights. In all of the billions that were invested in Afghanistan, nobody bothered to ever protect those imams. No, nobody saw them as the goal of a future culture. Just letting them die. So we, you know, we influenced and we influenced in this town. And so we got a little bit of help to just give them some voice. And that was a great interfaith. So these are the boundaries of radical interfaith work that's going on right now. And, and, and in many ways, it's in league with some of the best impulses that are emerging across the planet of an absolute love and valuation of girls as well as boys, one of the most important revolutions in human psychology in history. And the evidence is overwhelming that the more women are in power and empowered from the local level to the national level, the less that war is an option. It's statistically proven everywhere. And it's very exciting. But you have to do it in a proper way from a cultural and religious point of view. You can't just stomp in there with Betty for Dan and expecting <laughs> that everybody's just going to get it. You know, so it takes the, the, the kind of conflict resolution work and diplomacy and interfaith respect that the people in this room get. So there's many exciting things going on if you look at the aggregate. On, you know, on, a, on a one level, it, it's good for people like to me to be in pain and sorrow over Palestine and Israel and, and Syria. But on another level, I, again, in terms of self-therapy, it's taking out the whole. It's taking a vision of the whole. <coughs> and you people of faith, and you're better at it than I am. Oh.